If you could have a superpower, what would it be? After talking with today's guest, Dr. Giancarlo Licata, I think I want my superpower to be sleep. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, author and founder of Stowell Learning Centers, where we help children and adults permanently change their learning and attention challenges, including dyslexia. We have a fascinating show for you today. You are going to learn some surprising reasons why sleep is so important and how to get more and better sleep. Lauren Ma, come on in and say hi. 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 Hello. Hi, everyone. This is Lauren, uh, director of the Irvine Center in Orange County, California. And I'll be taking your comments and questions on social media, on Facebook, and on YouTube. So say hi. I like to know who's here. Um, and if you have questions for our guests today or Jill, uh, leave them in the comment section. Last week, we were we were so popular. There were so many questions that we didn't get to them all. But if you if that happens again and we're short on time, we'll be sure to answer them in the comment section. So don't be afraid to ask your questions um, and participate in today's show. Perfect. Hey, Lauren, if you had if you could have a superpower, what would it be? Um, I think it would be the ability to read minds, and I know that's um, not a popular um, but opinion, but uh, yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm quite nosy. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we are going to be talking about sleep, something people don't usually think of as a superpower, but it is a hugely important ingredient to academic and social success. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stoll. Our guest today is Dr. Giancarlo Licata. Dr. Licata is the founder of Vital Brain Training, Vital Head and Spinal Care, and the co-founder of Pasadena Interpersonal Community. His focus is on applied neuroscience, chronic pain, and interprofessional collaboration. He is a member of the International Association of Applied Neuroscience, the National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association, Council on Upper Cervical Care, and the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. Vital Head and Spinal Care is a brain-based health practice in Pasadena, California, focusing on brain-based tools to improve pain and performance. Established in 2008, Vital has helped over 2,000 clients, including professional athletes from the NFL, MLB, and the NCAA. Dr. Licata and Vital have been featured on PBS, ABC, WebMD, and now LD Expert Live. Welcome, Dr. Licata. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm excited Good to be here. Good morning. Hey, I was fascinated when we talked earlier about sleep. Um, do you think one of the positive outcomes of this stay at home time might be that people are getting more sleep? It could be, it could be, I hope so. <clears throat> I think we have more time available to sleep. And so I think if we can structure it right, yes, it'll be great. <laughs> Otherwise not we just binge watch all night long. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that there is that. But I was thinking about the fact that people, you know, don't have to get up and rush it to, to beat the traffic or, you know, whatever. So, right. well, there was a study by the CDC in 2016 that said that more than a third of American adults are not getting enough sleep on a regular basis. And a study presented at the American Academy of Pediatrics last year indicated that 52% of children ages 6 to 17 get less than the recommended nine hours of sleep. So we are kind of a sleep-deprived society, and that seems like a really big problem. Right. How does that <clears throat> impact functioning and learning? Right. I mean, it, it's a problem because it's so prevalent, you know, um, but it's also a problem because it's so vital. It's so necessary for so many things. And so, um, 
we're going to dive into some of the, the the deeper reasons as to what sleep does, how it affects us, how it it either becomes our superpower, and and helps our learning or our children um, learn and recover and and be more emotionally regulated, or how it's actually hindering them over and over and over again, and how parents are spending all of this money for support and for um, and and the reading articles on what to do when um, there's something that's free. There's something that's probably more powerful than anything uh, as sing any single thing that they could do. And um, and it's available to them just tonight. So hopefully we can go into that and uh, and we can empower all the parents uh, to you know help their kids learn more. Wow, that sounds amazing. When we were talking, you had said that to really understand sleep, we kind of need to understand some of the definitions. Yeah. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah, so so we're going to go, and if that's okay, Jill, one of the things that I want to do is establish how powerful sleep is first, if you're okay with that, and then we'll oh, go right into the definitions, um, because I don't think that that moms, uh, and especially especially moms, but us dads too, we, we lag behind. Um, if when our child is getting up in the morning or our child is in school and and they can't pay attention and they're they're you know sitting they're they're sitting at their desk tapping their feet or the their the teachers are complaining and writing home saying that you know Johnny isn't able to pay attention in class or he's disturbing his classmates um we would never even begin to think that um that maybe it was the previous night's sleep that was starting to dysregulate him to begin with right or um or if um, if you know our daughter is having a hard time learning and and she's she's she has to study for a big test and 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 she's pulling all nighters for you know every day for the, for the last five days as she's preparing for this final exam, um, we wouldn't even begin to think that she's been sabotaging herself every day um, leading up to this exam and that her brain is actually less able to learn. Uh, retain and then then recall information, right? So these are things that sleep is going to be able to to help help our children, and um, and so that's where I want to kind of really, you know, I want parents to know that I have three kids, and and for me, when I when we started to regulate their sleep and and kind of put some boundaries, um, we saw changes all over the place. So that's that's the first thing, um, and then Jill, yes, absolutely. So when we think of sleep, I, I talk to parents often, and. I, they're all they're off they're often telling me I think my child is getting good sleep or um, or my, my son had really bad sleep yesterday and so when I ask them well what does that mean they're kind of giving me this big glob answer they say well um, he he woke up really tired and cranky or they say well he slept eight hours but that meant that he was in his room for eight hours but they don't know what mm -hmm. that really meant you know so mm -hmm. um, uh, we can go. We can go into what I call the, the horizontal definitions of sleep, and then also the vertical definitions of sleep, and uh, and we and we can dive into that if that's something you'd like to do. Great, sounds great. Just okay. you know, it's so fascinating to me. I mean, we all do it. We all sleep. So, um, and if it can really impact so much of our daily lives, I mean, it's it's fascinating to me to know as much as possible, and and for our parents, you know. That's a huge point that they have this thing that that they can do right now for free um, every day to support their child's learning and memory and attention. Right, right. It, it's like the um, it's the catalyst of every other therapy or treatment they're going to do. It's going to be it's the uh, it's it's the enzyme. It's the thing that's going to make everything better. Or it's yeah. going to be the thing that makes that hinders everything else that they do, right? So it often won't replace, you know, whether they, they whether you know, they're still clients or whether there's ed other educational therapists or other tutors. It may not replace them, but what it's going to do is just make their 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 capacity to help your child that much more effective, right? So yes, right. it's huge. Right. So. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, if that's okay, I'm gonna go into, um, so most of the times that we think about sleep, we're gonna think of it like a timeline. And we're gonna say, well, um, Johnny got eight hours of sleep, right? Well, if it's recommended nine, then that's that's simple. That's Johnny didn't get enough sleep last night. And we know that's gonna hinder him in many ways. Um, but until we, st until we start to understand what, what are the nuances of that, those eight hours or those nine hours, um, we won't be able to, to go into what, why every, each thing is, is so powerful. So, okay. So um, 
when did when did Johnny go to sleep? Did Johnny get eight hours by falling asleep at 12 midnight and waking up at eight? Was that good or bad for Johnny? He still got eight hours, right? Or was or what if he fell asleep at 7 p.m. and he woke up at three in the morning, right? Was is that good or bad? He got eight hours. And so um, one of the things that um, we know is that uh, what time we go to sleep may matter. And that, um, that for some children, going to bed earlier is gonna be really important. And for other children, going to bed later is gonna be really important. And if we don't understand and, and, and honor how our children's genetic makeup is, um, those eight hours are not gonna be created equal for them. So um, there is a, uh, there's a wonderful neuroscientist out of uh, uh, Sock Institute down in uh, uh, La Jolla, California. And his name is Sachin Panda. And he wrote a book called The Circadian Code. And it has many, many things that, that, are, that are brilliant. But one of the, the things that he really emphasized was that every person, every human being has a DNA predisposition to be either what we call night owls or uh, morning larks or somewhere in between. And so I usually tell parents, you know, if you can kind of first identify what is your child's natural cycle where do they tend to fall asleep? When do they tend to wake up in the morning? Um, if we don't understand that there's a genetic wiring that's going to predispose them to do to be one or the other, we may oftentimes be hindering them, trying to get them to wake up because we because we wake up early. And and if but if if Johnny is a night owl, his eight hours or his nine hours may be ideal starting from 11 p.m. to to maybe seven or, or eight a.m. That may be Johnny's ideal um, sleep sleep window. So what I want to do is is um, is first, you know, where is that window? Where is that window for Johnny? And Johnny's window may be different from Mary's window. And so um, so I really want to kind of go into that. And and Jill, you mentioned last time when we spoke uh, uh, a few days ago that that was a big insight even for you about raising your children back in that that you realized that your your daughters were they had a different window. Is that right? Yes, definitely. I am absolutely a morning person. And if I don't get my work done early in the morning, you know, by evening, it's like my brain is fried. But my daughter, who actually works with us now, she has always been a night owl. And, and so, you know, she would be doing homework at two in the morning sometimes. And, and even now she does a lot of her work late at night. And I can't even get my mind around that. But <laughs> right, right now, and that's huge. Um, and so now, you know, oftentimes what you asked is, is this better during this time, during the, the COVID st uh, shelter at home uh, period? Is this better for some of us for our sleep? I would say for some of us night owls, it may be. Um, mm -hmm. For some of us night owls who are, who really struggle getting up at six in the morning or five in the morning, and then have to be in school or, or, or commute to school. Um, and then they have to kind of, their brain is still trying to wake up and they're, they're having to be bright and chipper right at 8 a.m. That's going to really affect them. Their brain is not quite ready yet. That's not, that's not their window. So, um, so that's a big one. So first thing is kind of contextualizing this whole conversation will be, um, when is our child's natural window? Right. Um, the second thing is going to be um, when we think about sleep, we're going to think about how quickly did somebody fall asleep? We'll call that sleep onset. Um, how many times did they wake up in the middle of their sleep? We'll call that, uh, let's say, just uh, duration or how many interruptions there were. And then we're going to say, you know, what time did they tend to wake up? Right. Um, and what was the total length of that time? Um, and so now we start to see that some people have challenges falling asleep. And so they may sleep eight hours or nine hours, but they, they had to go to bed. They had to lay in bed for maybe 10 or maybe 11 hours. Um, their sleep onset was disrupted. And sometimes, and that's a different challenge. And that's something that, that we want to help uh, uh, parents with if our kids just can't wind down. Um, there's also the, ch the children that are waking up, you know, three, four, five, 30 times a night. Um, we have a client, a training client now who uh, he, we track his sleep data and we'll go into that. Um, but he, the other night, uh, a few weeks ago, he, he woke up 34 times. Now he, he didn't even remember that he was waking up, but we can see the interruptions throughout the night. 
Um, and so, of course, he's waking up and he's he's groggy, he's irritable, he's moody. Um, and so, and that is definitely has not been helping uh, all the other things that his mother is trying to help him with. So, and then of course, there's duration. Does somebody, you know, sleep for eight hours, nine hours, or or, or some of our kids sleeping for five, right? So that 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 gives us a, a framework to to understand sleep. But then we'll go deeper, right? So, any questions about that, Jill? Anything you want to dive into? Well, let's. Uh, let's check in with our audience, see if there are questions about that so far. I know I have some things that have started to come up thinking about parents and thinking, okay, if my kid's natural sleep window is late at night, how do I manage that around school? So, uh, Lauren, uh, let me just check in with you here. Oh, and we can't hear Lauren. Yeah, um, you know what? I'm gonna let you kind of figure that out. And But I was thinking when you talked about that, <clears throat> you know, really understanding your child's ideal window for sleep, right now during this time where we're all at home, um, that's a little bit, uh, maybe easier when you have to do school if you can if you can let them sleep in and and then just um, get up when they're ready and do school. And during school time, though, um, that isn't quite as easy. And I was thinking, well, you know, a, as a parent, if at least if you understand that, then you have your child get everything um, ready the night before because they're going to stay up a little bit later. And then they're going to get up, roll out of bed, throw on some clothes and go to school without having to do, well, breakfast, but, you know, not having to do a lot. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Correct. I mean, so now we're, we're entering into summertime. And so I think, um, uh, you know, for a lot of us now, the, cha the challenge parents have is creating some structure. Um, with school, there's too much structure. They can't work around that structure. Mm -hmm. um, but now, um, yes, I think that um, what I, what I've seen are is having parents set a, a schedule with for their children on a, on a weekly basis. They, they're gonna, you know, I've seen some parents say, mm -hmm. "Look, um, we're, you know, we now know Johnny that you tend to be a night owl. Well, um, it, let's have you try going to sleep at 11, and then let's have you wake up at any time." Let's just give you that freedom to wake up when you wake up, right? Now, what's amazing about sleep is that um, Johnny, if he needs, if he's sleep deprived, he may sleep, he may wake up at you know noon. He may wake up at one p.m. Who knows? But at some point, once he started filling that that up, um, his normal circadian rhythm, his normal cycles will start to reemerge again, and he he will start to wake up at a very predictable time. And it, it, it almost guaranteed won't be 11. It may be eight, it may be nine. Um, and, so, uh, and so by setting at least a, a kind of a preliminary beginning point for the night owls um, and letting them kind of find where they're gonna land uh, for the, the waking time, um, that becomes a very practical tool. And so the parents don't have to battle with their kids um, because you know we don't need one more thing to battle with. I have three kids, I know what that's like. Um, and so, and then it's, but at some point there's a little bit of structure where it says, look, we don't have structure right now. Everything is, is a little bit turned upside down, but this is our, our weekly schedule. This is what we do. And we can tweak it a little bit, you know, plus or minus an hour. Um, but let's work with this. And that becomes very powerful. I mean, that alone could oftentimes change, change things because then Johnny feels like he has a little bit of freedom. He gets to have right. his little bit of night owlness and, uh, and it becomes really helpful. And he, and he feels a little more understood. I think there are a couple of really important things that, here. One is that just because someone sleeps in, it doesn't mean they're lazy. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, honestly, as, as a morning person, it is a little tough for me to see people sleeping in really yeah. late. I, yeah. that doesn't fit my thinking exactly but but and and so then the other thing is education because you could have a night owl and a morning lark in the same family in your yeah. children and so one child really needs a bedtime of 8 30 and the other one needs a later bedtime mm -hmm. and and that isn't dependent 
on age really. And so that's a shift for parents and for kids to think, well, that's not fair. He gets to stay up later. So, you know, they, we really need to do a little education around that. Right. Yeah. There's a lot to navigate with that, of course. And that's, you know, and, and that's where it, it presents its own new challenges. But I still think they're they're worthy of, of trying to work out uh, because that way you don't, uh, you know, the, the, the fruit of that it becomes so helpful. So, yes, um, you, if you have more than one child, you have different sleep set schedules, sleep times. Yeah. Um, yeah. If if one of if, if, if you know, uh, my one of my daughters, Gianna, she's a night owl. And so and she will not wake up for at least an hour or two after the whole family is up. And we, we just have to honor that. And we all have to be quiet. We all have to, you know, be outside or do other things and um, and allow her to, to have that. And when she does, when you, we gift her that hour, right? How much is that? that? That one hour, her brain is just so ready for the day. She's so thankful. She's her, she's emotionally regulated. She's, mm. she's, She's more patient with her her brothers and sisters. Like it's just it, it's so valuable, right? Like so, when I think of the investment uh, and uh, of that one hour, it, it's so worth it, you know. So try it out for the parents. Yeah. I think it's big. Wow, I love the way you talked about that about honoring that, and then how how her brain is just ready for the day. That's yeah. That is a huge learning for many many parents and teachers. I think. Yeah. Hey, if you're just joining us, I'm Jill Stoll, founder of Stoll Learning Centers. My guest today is Dr. Giancarlo Licata, founder of Vital Head and Spinal Care. We are talking about sleep and why it is so critical to our kids' learning and all of our well-being. So uh, I know you have a lot of other things to talk about with sleep, so um, I'll, I'll give it back to you Okay, I interrupted you. No, no, no. This is great. Um, so, I, so I'm going to go now into the 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 vertical. Let's call this the qualitative, the quality of sleep. We've just talked about the quantity. We just talked about how much and when and how. Now we're going to talk about the quality because this is really valuable, and this is where I start to geek out, right? <laughs> um, and so, um, so it our brain cycles through different um, stages of sleep. And now, depending on the nationals or international associations, um, they'll break that up into five cycles or, um, or six cycles. I'm going to bring up one of them. I'm going to look it up so that I don't get it wrong. Um, but um, let me pull that up here. But it's the, from the American Association for Sleep Medicine. Um, it breaks up our sleep into five stages. And Listen to this because it's going to matter when I start giving you some some tips. Okay, so um, they break it up into five stages, and they call it stage W, N1, N2, N3, and R. Now, what does that mean? W, it's, it's basically wakefulness. They've defined as a, a, a stage of sleep, being awake. Um, mm -hmm. Then there's relaxed wakefulness, and they call that N1. Um, and then there's light sleep, and then there's deep sleep, and then there's REM sleep. So again, stage W is wakefulness. Stage N1, which means not, N is for non-REM. They're very original. Um, so non-REM one is relaxed awake. That's that kind of um, twilighty feeling just before we're ready to fall asleep. That's N1. Um, N2, non-REM non sleep, stage two is what we call light sleep. A lot of us and many of our children are spending maybe maybe too much of, of our time in light sleep, though it has a purpose. Um, then there's stage N3 or non-REM sleep stage three. And that is what we call deep sleep or slow wave sleep. Um, and that is gonna be very profound, especially for um, a, a lot of learning and growth. And then there's gonna be stage R, which very originally is for REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, or for the rest of us dreaming. It's when we dream. So we go through these five stages. And what's fascinating is that in every, every eight hour period of time, every night, our brain is, is going through each of the five stages about five times. With the, ex with the exception of wakefulness, I'm gonna take that back. We'll go through four of them, right? Four stages, five times a night. And that is gonna be very powerful when we start going deeper and deeper into this. So you talked a little bit about deep sleep being um, really important for, for learning. Well, and, and I suppose you're going to talk to us a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. but, 
but I'm thinking right away, I think, okay, well, how do I make sure my kid gets enough deep sleep? Yeah, yeah no, exactly. So, uh, so some of us have started he hearing about deep sleep. So um, I'm gonna use an example. I'm gonna use an example of a big test, right? And so let's say this test is on Wednesday. And um, what's fascinating is that um, if we don't have good sleep on Tuesday night, right? On Tuesday night, what our brain is gonna be doing is it's going to be cleaning out all of the previous knowledge that has been stored mm. in the brain, all of our short-term memory from what we learned in school on Tuesday, um, I, there's our brain has a temporary storage uh, and it's like our USB stick for some of us. Um, and so um, Johnny learned, you know, went to school, learned a lot of information on Tuesday and, um, and now he needs to study for a big test on Wednesday. Um, on Tuesday night, he needs to, when he goes to sleep, that kind of superficial sleep or what we call N1 sleep, or excuse me, N2 sleep, um, that light sleep, our, Johnny's starting, his brain is starting to filter out what information is worth keeping uh -huh. and what information is just extraneous, which what's we, what don't we need? And then when he cycles into deep sleep, the brain begins to deepen that knowledge. It begins to hardwire, it literally starts creating um, neurons start firing over and over again uh, until they begin to start to pattern themselves. And they, there's a saying that that neurons or, or the, the cells of the brain, neurons that fire together, wire together. And mm -hmm. so they start reinforcing that information. And then it's in REM sleep that, um, that Johnny starts then to incorporate all of that knowledge into the rest of his knowledge base. It's where he really turns that short-term memory into long-term memory. It's where he he basically uploads the USB stick, and now that that all that data is now in the rest of the computer. And so his brain creates new connections and starts thinking through things. and And it's when he's dreaming that he's actually he's 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 processing what he learned on Tuesday. So and then he's gone through that five times or so at least, hopefully, as he's sleeping through the night. So that when Wednesday comes and he was able to wake up and and, and had enough of, the, of of his rest. Um, his brain now can recall when he's sitting at the desk and he's got his pencil in hand and he's filling out the little bubbles. Um, he, he's now able to recall that information. He's able to, to make connections and, and, and when they ask those trick questions, he's able, oh, I got that. I know that because of all the stages that he went through, right? So um, wow. now, which one do you think, which one should he not have, right? Which one is, which one is not valuable, right? What's <laughs> fascinating is they all are. Right, right. Wow, that is that was a a great picture. We always, you know, in most cases, um, short, frequent um, times of study are better than one cramming session. And in a sense, that's kind of what the brain is doing every night while you're asleep. Yeah. It's, you know, getting rid of the stuff you don't need, and then several times a night actually processing that information. So, wow, that's, that's right. really cool. It's really cool. I know. And so yeah. that's why I love that's, that's this, this wonderful synergistic relationship that us, you know, uh, applied brain people have with educators and, 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 and learning specialists like yourselves. Um, we get to understand the inner workings of the brain and then we get to share that. And then you get to use that, that, that information and you say, well, of course, that makes sense why what we've been doing for the last 10 years has been working. Great. Right. Or let me modify what we're doing and make it even better based on the new data that's coming out. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's a fascinating uh, realm and it's changing every single day. So I, so I have some more questions for you about how parents can, you know, can apply some of this. But Lauren. Uh, yes. Can you hear me now? I yeah. my, oh, wow. my AirPods went to sleep. <laughs> what about that? Okay. <laughs> so I have some catch up to do. I want to make sure that we say hi to our viewers. We have Sue saying hi and Kathy and Tracy says hi. She is a professional that is going to actually be on our show in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So it's great. I want to, um, Deborah Ann is here and we know Deborah Ann from, um, OC Chad. Chad is a support group for, 
uh, parents and individuals with ADHD. And she actually has a, a few comments on here. She's representing the Night Owl group, which I am a proud member of as well, and my whole family. And so she's saying like with her family, her family is a family of night owls and, but yet the world seems to be kind of more conducive to the morning lark. So school starts early. It's hard when you have that kind of natural sleep cycle. And so she has a, a question later on or, or an experience that she shared. And then I'm going to take it away because now we're covered. Okay. She just talks about her own son's sleep cycle that they found through a sleep app, which sounds kind of some of the monitoring that you're doing. And they found that his most restful period was actually right before he, he wakes up. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, I mean, what advice if, if, if a parent does do a sleep study with their child or does get that information that their most restful period of time is actually in the earlier mornings when we need to be up for school and work, um, what mm -hmm. advice do you have for parents? that that yeah. is our natural sleep cycle. Yeah, no, it is a tough one. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great uh, a, a neuroscientist out of UC Berkeley called, his name is Matthew Walker. And he wrote a phenomenal book called, I think, Why We Sleep. And um, and he speaks to that. He, you know, he, he's, he calls himself the sleep ambassador. And he, he's got a mission to try to um, change uh, educational systems so that they can start later. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. go figure. Um, so it's a very real challenge. So I just want to kind of, you know, uh, validate that. First of all, there's certain things we can't do um, other than either change schools or, like Jill, you mentioned, um, leave everything ready so that you have up to the last minute to get in. Um, we've had some parents who um, they 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 ask and petition to skip zero period or first period. Um, so that they have that extra time. So it depends on what the needs are, right? Um, and especially if you know if there are certain learning disabilities that are already there and inherent, I think that then we already have more flexibility. And so um, I think it's cheaper for schools to let the child come in an hour later than to provide more, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one help and support while they're there in school. So one is if if you can petition for it, try to get an extra hour. Try to have them come in at, at the next period. Right. That's a great um, suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've talked to parents who some have changed schools um, because based on the sleep time uh, we're in Pasadena, California. And so and we and there are so many there are dozens and dozens of both public and private schools in Pasadena. And there are some schools that start at 735 mm -hmm. and there are some schools that start at 810. And so mm. believe it or not, that, that extra time may matter for you. It may matter for your family. And so that's something that you may consider. Right. Um, and um, we have um, another comment specifically about teenagers. And, and I've heard this data as well. So I don't know if it's pseudo data. I don't know. Uh, but is the sleep cycle for teenagers later than six to 12 year olds? Or once they go through puberty, yeah. kind of all that, that hormonal um, fluctuation can contribute to sleep because she says her teenage daughter actually doesn't sleep until very late and will sleep until noon um, if you or la later if you allow her and I've heard that from a ton of our families of teenagers right. that that's when kind of sleep becomes um, dysregulated and parents I think feel like you're wasting the day or you're being lazy is that I mean is that normal though I hear it a lot from our right. families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it'll be a matter of degree. I think that, um, so again, it seems very, very well established that there's a, there's a genetic predisposition towards a certain type of morning, a morning lark or night owl or somewhere in between. Some of us are flexible. But they're also, once you have that hardwiring, there's a bit of variance depending on the developmental stage, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so what you're, what you're pointing to is absolutely, teenagers will tend to T will move toward the night owl side. And those that are already night owls, it tends to be more extreme. And those that even are morning larks, they're just not as larky as they would be in, in, you know, later in life, right? Um, and so, so one, it is, you know, yes, to give them some grace uh, that that's not abnormal. Now, the challenge is that that can get also um, taken to an extreme. And so this is where uh, we'll introduce another concept, which is um, light becomes a very, very powerful um, modifier or tweaker of our sleep cycle. 
And so um, I'm gonna so I'm gonna set the stage and then I'll answer the question if that's okay. Is that all right? Yeah, great. Yes, okay, Perfect. great. Okay. So the quick stage is this. Um, we have receptors in the back of our eyes that um, feed input into the areas that, that affect our circadian rhythm, or meaning our, our sleep and wake cycles. And so um, blue light, the frequency of blue light, um, seems to trigger the brain to say, ah, it's morning, it's daytime. And it will already begin to time backwards when sleep will eventually happen. Right, so um, so it becomes this anchoring point that that tells the brain it's morning, it's daytime. Let's get going, but we know sleep's coming in about twelve, however many hours. Right, um, then as the day goes on, uh, with the sun, with the, the the coming sunset and the the warmer oranges and reds of of the evening, um, those oranges and reds start to trigger that those receptors, that those sensors in the back of our eyes, that starts telling the brain. All right, we're getting close. We're about two to three hours away for sleep time. And so it begins to, to wind our body down. It begins to prepare us for sleep. And so um, now the challenge is that that has gotten disrupted, right? So how many people are on their phones until eight, nine, 10, 11? Um, now, how does a phone have to do with the color of, of light and our receptors in our eyes? Well, these iPhones or these, these uh, iPads or the computer is dominant, has a huge amount of blue light. So it's starting to confuse our natural cycles um, of when's day, when's night, when is it the beginning, is it the end? And so teenagers tend to become, you know, now they, they've, they, they've earned their phone, now they're on their phone all day long, and now they're on their phone at night, and now they have Zoom calls and they have classes. And so what happens is that's gotten so dis disrupted. So the teenager phase is taken now to an extreme because that, that cycle has, has, has become just, it, it's, it's off track. So I don't know if that's helpful to begin to start to understand that it's normal, but um, I think that there have been things that have pushed it too far to the edge. And those are things you have access to, right? Um, and so either having conversations, bringing that down, saying, look, phones until, you know, 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, again, that that whole issue of education, really helping your teens explore sleep together, have them listen to this broadcast, because, you know, if you just say, well, OK, no phones after 10 p.m., mm -hmm. well, now that feels very punitive to a teen. Mm -hmm. And and but but as soon as we give people a reason for something you know, they're much more open to, to solving the problem. Yeah. 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 That's huge. It reminds me, and this is a slight aside, but it reminds me of a study they did and I'll, I'll I can look it up and we can include it in the, sh in the show notes um, where they, they had people waiting in line and they, and they had someone else come in front of, of, of one cut in line essentially. And they, they asked a person who had been waiting in line. They, they, they asked, they said, can I, can I cut in front of you? Now, people have, you know, half said yes, the other half said no. And then, um, but when they, they did, a, they, they tweaked it and said, we're going to tell, we're going to say, can I cut in front of you? Because, and when they gave a reason for this intervention, for this thing that nobody wants to get, you know, have someone cut in front of them, when, when they gave them a reason, people were more likely to say, go ahead. Yes, please go, go on. They're, they're more compliant. They're more, they're more cooperative. And the irony is they, they didn't even give them a reason that was a reason. They said, can I cut in front of you because I need to go in front of you. Just that just, there, there was no actual logical uh, cause for cutting in front, but the word because the, the fact that there was, they were given some, some extra information already made the person more compliant, more cooperative. So as parents, we have to use that psychology and say, you know, again, Bobby, you know, you're up all night. You know, I want you to, to be well. I wanted to go. I want you to be able to get good grades. Um, what if you went to sleep a little bit earlier? Because, right, it may help you not have to study as many hours in, in this week, right? That could be it. That, that may add to, to what Jill was saying and maybe make Bobby more compliant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, I mean, you kind of already touched on this and this is, this is how parents are feeling right now. And they've 
I've, I've certainly gotten this question, but yes, our kids are spending more time on devices right now because they are doing distance learning. Yeah. Um, and so you talked about how that absolutely can disrupt the sleep cycle because well, one, the stimulation, but also the light, just mm-hmm. having that and being having access to that late at night. I know for me as a mom um, and, and the moms out there, like, you know, between the hours of 10 and 12, that is me time. And so yeah. that is the only time I have to myself. And so that's my natural tendency is to be on a device. So I know that that's not yeah. necessarily healthy, but it's kind of like, you know, you right. do what you can. Um, we do yeah. have a question from, um tracy that just says how do we you know how do we find out if kids are having trouble with onset versus waking up um especially kids six to ten well you know one is observing them i think some as parents will tend to know i think if we uh, that you know they're in bed and they're you just hear them up You, you you just know they're not asleep um and so that tends to be something that we see in our family. Now, you know, not every family is the same. And sometimes the parents are, we're in a big house, the kids are on the other, the other wing of the house. And so we can't even hear them. Um, one thing that we do is we use a, a, a natural sleep monitor. Um, and so my son has worn one, my daughter has worn one, my second daughter has worn one. And so that gives me some insight. And so um, we can see exactly what time their brain switched into sleep, right? What, what time they went from wakefulness down to sleep. And then we got to see the cycles that they went through. Um, and then we also, we were able to see how many times they woke up and we were able to see what time they actually officially woke up, right? So, um, Again, there are there are two that we recommend. Um, there is uh, one is a ring, and so that becomes a little bit challenging with with hand size as our kids start growing more and more. Um, but it's called the Aura Ring, and it's spelled differently. It's O U R A, and uh, I was just mentioning earlier that 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 became very famous once Prince, I think it was Prince Harry, was seen wearing one. Um, and then there's the Whoop Strap. I'm actually wearing one now. Um, and um, and it the, uh, many pr- professional athletes use this, and so um, so we have a, we have a, a contract with them, we're, we're a partnership with them, but we can see how they how all clients are doing. And so again, my son wore the strap, and I was able to see he goes to, he goes to bed at seven o'clock, but he doesn't fall asleep until seven fifty, mm-hmm. right? And so he has roughly a fifty minute de- uh, uh, onset uh, delay. And so that's something that then we can start working with and tweaking. So, so that way the, the, the intervention or the, the, the effort that we're gonna put in is gonna be laser targeted to the problem that they have rather than trying to fight these battles that may have nothing to do with you know, improving their, their sleep at all. And I, I wanted to just go back a little bit um, before we go on with another question, but you had mentioned to me, and I'm not very technical, so I have not found this, but you mm-hmm. mentioned to me that there's a setting on the iPhone, at least, maybe on all smartphones, that, that can change the light a little bit. That's right. Um, I'm going to lift mine up now so I don't give you the wrong name of it. But every every iPhone, if you have one, has now an inherent setting, and I think it's called night mode. Um, if uh, also if maybe we can we can uh, add in the show notes if I'm if I'm if I'm not correct. But so night mode has a setting. It there is a setting where you can essentially tell the time you want it to, to start to go to go into the reds and oranges and what time you want it to turn off. And it will naturally filter all of the blue light or into different degrees of the blue light um, during those those nighttime hours. Right. So now you don't have to fight the battle. Right. If you have to pick your battles with a teenager, I'm sure uh, there's 50 a day. Um, you know, maybe you can take this one off. Right. And say, look, fine. Be on your, your, your phone. But at the very least, let's experiment for the next week and just start with the setting and see if your if your sleep is able to get more regulated. And if it's not enough, then we'll move on to the next thing. Right. But that's one thing. So, yes. Thank you, Jill, for that reminder. And so night mode uh, on all Apple devices. Great. Yeah. Um, we also have a question. Speaking of Apple devices, I guess we're doing commercials for them. So how, oh, how right. accurate is the, the Apple Watch sleep app? So is that an accurate kind of measurement of sleep 
um, that parents can use for data? Yeah, you know, we test it out. Now again, we're not, you know, tech testers. Um, we just had to find things that were as accurate as we could find for our clients. And, and the short answer is we didn't find it being as accurate. Um, this, the Apple Watch was not as accurate as, let's say, the Whoop or the Aura Ring. And the short kind of reason for that um, is that um, if we look at the inside of our Apple Watch, we'll see a green light. It's, that's usually a, that's a sensor. And that's great for a lot of motion. So it's great for, for fitness and steps and so on. But um, when we're still, um, the better, the better uh, tech has an infrared light or a red light. And, and so the Aura Ring, the, the Whoop Strap uses the infrared and, and red sensors, and that gives, that, that gives you more accuracy. And so um, I think it's better than nothing. And if you already have one, then you don't have to invest the money. But um, we don't see it as being as, um, as accurate in the details. And if, we, if those details um, are what we need to, to know which intervention to do, then it may be worth spending a little bit of the money and getting a, a specific app, or excuse me, a specific uh, uh, monitor. Monitor, yeah, I see the the same uh, parent asking about Fitbit, so that would be kind of in the same category. Um, the Fitbit watch for monitoring yeah, sleep. That, that now again, I don't know what their latest uh, models have been, and maybe, if, but I think the short answer is ask if they have the red light. If they have the red light in addition red to light. green lights, as a parent, I just give me the simple you think that look for that. If it doesn't have that, then it may not be enough, right? Um, Good tip. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, and then we have a question regarding just we talked about routine, um, and and it sounds like it is unique to the individual child or or adult. Um, um, but what what would be ideal? So if you had a morning lark, if you had if you have a child who, you know, needs to be in bed at, at a certain time, wakes up early, is naturally like that. What would be an ideal time regarding meal time or technology? Yeah. Um, as opposed to a, a night owl. Yeah. Um, so with routine, um, so our meal time matters, and I didn't go into that because I talked about light. And so mm -hmm. our our meals matter. Um, so if we're going to if if our, if if our family eats dinner at nine p.m., um, we can't realistically expect our child to be able to then switch right into sleep. You know that the next hour or the next half hour. And so if our child has a, a, is a morning lark and has to, you know, get to bed around 730, then, you know, yeah, it may not be cool, but we may, it may be wiser to, you know, eat a little bit earlier, five, 530. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so when is, when are these anchor moments in our, in our ritual? Of our of our day, um, what our our our, our meals one? Um, when when was the last time they were outside? Um, if they were able to play and run outside um, during the sunset, believe it or not, their the the sun's rays um, already begin to cue that child to get ready for the night, right? So that can be a second thing. Um, and then even the setting the lighting. Sometimes my wife looks at me and she thinks I'm strange, but after sunset, I'm turning down some of the lights in the house. Um, I'm, I'm especially turning off anything that has blue light in our house. Uh, sometimes I'll put candles on. We'll have a, I love our fireplace. And so the fireplace, that those reds and oranges are just, you know, they're, they've been telling our, our brains for thousands of years, you know, it is time now for sleep. And so um, take advantage of that, you know? So th those routines, those rhythms, the ritual of your, of your uh, day, um, light, outside, meals, if you just tweaked those and, ma and made some, some, a little bit of consistency through the week, um, oftentimes you find that just, the kids just go. They're just, they just, they're, they just go right in. Try that first, right? And then, that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. As yeah. a parent, absolutely. Um, I want to get in just another, I mean, so we've been talking about kids and teens specifically. That's the population, obviously, that we, we work with. We work with adults, too. So Mark is saying, what about adults? What do we need for yeah. sleep? Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, that's important, too. Who's running mm -hmm. the ship here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get it. You know, I was I was just sharing the irony of me being here, telling everybody about the value of sleep is I had horrible sleep last night. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, they were outside of my my control. And so that's that's something that we just had to deal with. But um, 
what do we adults do? I think the same principles apply. That's why I love principles. That's why I like build, you know, finding what are the things that, that are universal and, and we can apply them at different times. What are we doing? If like find out if you're a morning lark or a, or a night owl. Um, you know, get outside and, and be in the sunlight first thing in the sunrise and 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 during sunset. And if you if you can't do both, try one. Um, when is your last meal? Um, that's that'll be huge. Um, also, you know, we can go into if we have time or maybe later, um, you know, we can go into what do we eat during our meals? Sometimes if you have a huge three course meal with, you know, that's got 3000 calories in it and just sitting in your stomach, um, our insulin, our, our blood sugar is also another modifier of our circadian rhythm. And so, mm -hmm. um, so that can be, be throwing us off. Um, are we drinking alcohol? If, if we have more than a couple glasses of alcohol that night, it is almost certain to um, reduce dramatically our REM sleep, our dreams. We dream less. Now that matters because we also don't process our emotions as well, because that's when we're processing emotions. It's when we don't have all of that long-term conversion from short-term memory. So, um, so those are a lot of things I'm throwing at you, Mark, but uh, I, you know, start, start with one. Start with one mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, and try it for a week and then see how that goes. And if it doesn't do it, then just check that off and go to the next one. You know, you don't have to do them all today. Right. So it sounds like that the figure speech sleep on it that came from somewhere <laughs> that we sleep right. on things to process our emotions. That's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Um, couple more. This is a very popular topic with our with our audience. Okay. Um, Iris asked about music. What about music? to help us sleep. Um, we have a couple of sound therapy programs that actually do um, have their research in sleep and are meant for improved sleep. Um, what's your finding on that? No, I think that's great. I think I know less about music. Um, I think that it can serve at the very least two purposes. One, it can, it can filter out noise because some of us don't have control over who lives above us in our apartments or who's barking outside or, you know, the sirens outside. And so sometimes the music already just acts as a filter. Um, but then, yes, there's there, there, there have been studies. I, I'm not as familiar with them. And you may want to share more, Lauren, but um, where it can, it can it's different types of music can get us into different stages of sleep. My only my only thought is. Um, you know, maybe at least if we have a setting with a, where it can turn itself off, um, mm -hmm. because the challenge is, is that um, you can actually almost trap a stage of sleep throughout the night using sound. And so mm -hmm. um, if there's certain music that seems to be great to get us into that deep sleep, but it's keeping us kind of artificially more in deep sleep than 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 the rest, you know, we'll we'll feel that too afterwards. So. That, that would be my short answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the programs we're familiar with, the listening program, TLP, has a, a program called Sleep Genius that is mm -hmm. supposed to be really good for um, sleep. And I believe it does. It's a, a certain duration of time and then turns off, but it's a headband that you wear. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and then Nancy asks, like, how many days on average um, do you need in order to track a pattern with sleep? That's a great question, Nancy. Um, yeah, you know, you usually need about two weeks minimum, right? Mm -hmm. um, some people say a month. Um, now, you know, if for us, we've we've seen enough uh, um, uh, clients that a week will give us some insight, but we keep watching that. Um, but you do want a baseline, so um, you know, so both Whoop and Aura Ring will often recommend that you where at a certain time. And what's interesting is they, they're now, their technology has artificial intelligence where it learns more and more about the nuance of what your body is telling the, the, the sensors. So it gets more and more accurate with time as well. So it's not just enough to set a pattern, it's also to train the technology to you so it's more accurate. So I would say at least, you know, again, a week, two weeks is probably a good, a good midpoint. And some people may say a month, right? But Look, if you just need to get something going, put it on, wear it a week, and then just start experimenting. Okay. And then um, Lanya asks, what about white noise as opposed to music? Now, I will tell you, this is this is something I love. I love white noise. Is that yeah. bad? Um, it's, you know, I, I don't think it's bad. I don't think it is. Um, 
uh, I'm here actually at the beach. Uh, and so, and we had our window open and we had the white noise of the ocean mm, all the night long. White noise. <laughs> I can tell you that that was a bad thing. So I don't think so. Now, again, I'm not as familiar with, with, with that um, because, but I do think it probably will still artificially keep things. But what I would say is try it, try it for some of us. Um, some of us, it's huge and it keeps us, both it helps our onset. For a lot of us, it helps us from waking. And so its ability to kind of artificially keep us in that state will be a little bit of, um, it'll be a bit of a crutch to help our brain not wake as often. Now, in a perfect world, we'd go deeper into a why is it waking to begin with, but for now, use it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I think I think I got to everybody's comments and Great. questions. Thank you guys for asking and for tuning in. It seems like a, a fascinating topic and definitely resonates with our audience. So thank you. Fantastic. And it's and it's something that impacts every single one of us. So oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, this is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stoll here with our guest. Dr. Lakata of Vital Head and Spine. We've been talking about sleep, but Dr. Lakata, there are so many other things that you do. I know uh, at Stowell Learning Center, we're partnering with uh, Dr. Lakata and Vital to provide brain training for ADHD. And I know you work with concussion and headaches and many other things. If someone wanted to learn more or get a hold of you, what is the best way for them to do that? Well, we would encourage them to just go straight to our website. It's uh, four words, vital, head, and spine. And I think there, they, you, know, you can start learning about what we do and who we help the most and who we don't. We, we really are, are you know, uh, focused on certain types of clients, but um, that would be the best bet. We are on Facebook, we are on Instagram. Uh, so you can try us there at Vital Head and Spine, but I'd say the website, start there. Perfect, and any last minute thoughts for us today? No, I think what you're doing is, is a phenomenal resource for parents across the country and across the world. And so um, what the sleep will be such a powerful, it will be your superpower. Um, put it to use, uh, let, let everyone know. And, um, and I think you will share more resources and answers. So um, I'm just, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you so much. This was, this was really, really fascinating. Fantastic. And it's by the way, I claimed sleep as my superpower. So I don't know if I want to share or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's like love. It's free. The more, the more you give, the more you have, right? So <laughs> that's, right. that's right. Yeah, but I think the world will be a better place if we all slept a little bit more. Let's try it. I agree. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We are live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific on YouTube and Facebook. Next Tuesday, Lauren and I will be here to talk about executive function and answer your questions about learning disabilities, auditory processing, dyslexia, executive function, anxious kids or whatever you wanna talk about. Lauren and I can easily take up the whole hour by ourselves, but we really want you to guide the conversation. So look in our upcoming live videos on our Facebook page for next, next week's show announcement and make sure to set a reminder and post your questions in the comment section so that we can talk about them next Tuesday. At Stowell Learning Centers, we help children and adults permanently correct learning and attention challenges, including dyslexia. If your child or teen was struggling in school before the pandemic, or if you're noticing now how hard they seem to have to work, give us a call. We are open. We are doing remote screenings, remote sessions. We're starting new students all around the country. If you would like to speak with someone about your child, give us a call at 877-774-0444 or visit us at stowellcenter.com. Thank you again, Dr. Lakata, and sleep well, everyone. Don't forget to tune in next Tuesday at 10 a.m.